Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Heather Graham, who is an organic geochemistry uh, geochemist at the Astrobiology Analytical Laboratory at Goddard Space Flight Center, and the Deputy Project uh, Principal Investigator for the Laboratory for Agnostic Biosignatures, which is going to be your topic today. Her interests. Uh, uh, focus on the development of tools and techniques that can help us identify evidence of living systems that may not share common biochemical heritage with life as we know it here on Earth, and also focuses on multidisciplinary approaches. So she'll be speaking of, on agnostic biosignatures and life detection. Heather, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, David. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been a really fun couple of days, and it's it's been especially exciting because, you know, the range of conversations that we've been able to have and the range of talks are, are just immense and so many interesting ideas. And I often find myself being the one with um, seemingly wacky ideas. So it's fun to, to, to be, um, you know, to have my ideas uh, as just part of the landscape of ideas at a meeting. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about agnostic signatures and also decision trees that we can use when we're thinking about detection that might include agnostic systems. And to get us started, I, I thought I'd break it down since we've heard a lot of planets, a lot of, we had animals and dinosaurs and everything happening today, just to bring us back to what I mean when I'm talking about these things, because I'm going to keep using the same words over and over again during this talk. So when I say what is a biosignature, what I'm really talking about is an indication of past or present life with whatever discipline home you find yourself in. And one of the reasons I like to just call it an indication is because this can be a chemical, this can be a physical manifestation, this can be geological, it can be planetary scale. And I also like to, to relate biosignatures back to the past because really so much of astrobiology is rooted in the methodologies of paleobiology. And it's been really great to see as many paleobiologists as we have over the past couple of days talking about how we can take um, uh, wisdom from that discipline and apply it to astrobiology as well. So these biosignatures, these indications can be something um, very simple like fossils that are, that are recognizable and, and relate past life to us and, and we can think about them. Um, they don't necessarily have to be part of that organism itself, though. A biosignature can be something left behind by an organism. It could be a trackway of any sort of organism. It could be uh, just an imprint left in a rock. That counts as a biosignature um, and, uh, and can, can not only indicate something about past life, but that could be present life that you're just not seeing right now. So just thinking broadly about what this can mean, biosignature. A biosignature can also be very complicated. We can think of complicated molecules um, that are really hard to, to imagine manufacturing abiotically. Um, and these are, are very potent examples of bi biosignatures that can tell us something about the contemporaneous contemporaneous nature of whatever life we think we are looking for when we see this biosignature. Now, when we talk about an agnostic biosignature, and this is a little bit of uh, a current buzzword, so I'm going to break that down too. It has nothing to do with religion, first of all. An agnostic biosignature is just that same thing, an indication of past or present life that does not presuppose a molecular makeup or a metabolism based on life on Earth. Um, so if you think about so many of the really wonderful planetary missions that have been described, they're very much uh, thinking of their target targets their analytes of interest by analogy to systems on Earth. And that's not necessarily a terrible idea. Um, we have robust ways of understanding those systems. In many cases, we know how those can and age, and so we can uh, easily find them in geologic records. Um, and also many of the plants we've been talking about, especially today, not necessarily yesterday, um, are nearby neighbors. Whereas Dave was just talking about, we may even share chemical heritage with any life we find on our next door neighbors, um, be it Venus or Mars. And so an agnostic biosignature just takes us away from that idea of uh, a ready-made 
um, uh, analyte set that you get when you normally think about biosignatures. Um, so yes, we'd, we'd like to break this down then to thinking about fundamental observations. And uh, this is where I like to try and get people to think about, yes, but what makes, what makes that biosignature possible for whatever analyte of interest is relevant to your discipline? Um, another way to think about this too is to understand what life looks like in the absence, in its absence, and then look for deviations from that system. So you can think this is basically, we're thinking about fundamentals, not analogy, thinking more about physics than, than um, uh, observations based on our own planet. And then also thinking about perturbations that can indicate um, that there has been a living system in that environment on that landscape, whatever it may be, whatever your analytes of interest are. So this is a, a diagram that I like to show to try and indicate this, that life is an energetic response to an environment. We could have many, many meetings to try and talk about definitions of life that would um, be to our liking. And this is just one general way based on things we can see um, that life is, is imposing energy uh, on its environment and modifying it in ways that accommodate um, its, its metabolism, whatever that metabolism may be. So I like to use this diagram because as we, we can see on this Newton's cradle, that um, ball right there is doing something we didn't expect. Even if a system is moving, why is that one going a little bit up? Is that little bit of extra energy that you're seeing in this system right here life? Um, and does that little bit of extra energy give us a way to recognize it as a physical or chemical effect on a landscape, um, be it another planet or our very own, as we were hearing in talks yesterday with Shino and Barbara Sherwood Lawler. So I'm just gonna talk about a couple of different search patterns um, that are based um, not necessarily on analogy, but more on things that we think would be uh, difficult to do without that little bit of extra energy that comes from life. And one of these analyte targets that we can think about is um, intrinsic complexity. So this is not necessarily about sex, this is about objects. And these objects that I'm here are high structure molecules. And what we find in living systems is there's an awful lot of molecules that are highly structured with what we would call intrinsic complexity. Now, of course, complexity is um, pornography, right? Like just as Father Stewart said, it's, it's everybody kind of has their own definition, but they know it when they see it. And it's been a struggle um, when thinking about agnostic biosignatures to try and say, well, what is intrinsic complexity? How can we make that a metric? How can we make that a measurement or a number that we can relate to some piece of data that we could collect on this planet or another planet? And so I'm going to go through um, one definition that uh, I've been working with colleagues on to try and define this intrinsic complexity that we can see in molecules. So all of these molecules on this slide are all things that we know and love from life, cholesterol, ATP, chlorophyll, and they all obviously, even in these ball and stick models, have a lot going on, a lot of heteroatoms, a lot of rings, a lot of doodads, um, and we could just look at them and say, oh yeah, that looks complex to me. Um, but we're going to ask ourselves, without making assumptions about the structure, is there a threshold of all these different pieces above which um, a molecule would be unlikely to form without supporting biological machinery. So in this slide, we're showing glycine, which we know and love from life, but we also know and love from stars and meteorites, as well as ATP. And I included another um, molecule here, uh, just because I know the next talk after me is technosignatures. And I wanted to try and embed a little bit of technosignatures idea into this as well, because this is a manufactured pharmaceutical. Um, and we can think of this molecule as a technosignature. It's not made by a, a metabolism, but it's definitely made by critters. Um, in labs. And this um, uh, has a lot of intrinsic complexity. And we can ask how likely would this antibiotic be to just arise in some chemical system uh, deep in the ocean out on another planet somewhere without the influence of life making it happen. So one way that we can approach this idea of intrinsic complexity is by counting the number of steps, the simplest way to construct a molecule from its parts um, including that simplifying feature of duplication. 
And I'll get to that a little bit more in a second. And so what we're seeing right here is the pathway from ethane to naphthalene. And you can basically break it down into five steps the way I've done it here. So we have, you know, just some elongation of that alkane set. We have a ring formation um, and then we have two rings come together. That's five steps. And we could say then, okay, naphthalene has this intrinsic complexity and we'll give it the number five. And, um, but we know that there's probably a lot of ways to do this too. Like what if we just started glomming together butanes? Does that just become three steps and then a bunch of duplications? And so the work that uh, the student who's referenced here on this paper did, Marsh Stuart Marshall, was to uh, look at this and look at all these molecules and say, wow, there's a lot of ways to put them together. Um, this is a big Lego problem. This seems like a job for math. And so he actually built an algorithm that attached this idea of how many steps does it take to make a molecule um, in, a, in a program using a Reaxis database and then said above a certain number of steps, are we only looking at molecules that are made by life? So here's an example of some more of those kind of mass steps. Um, and here we can see uh, early sort of forming of that boundary line between abiotic and biological molecules um, with ATP having 21 steps, penicillin 17, and then um, amino acids that we know and love from critters here on earth as well as meteorites having uh, assembly numbers of just seven or 12 steps. Um, so this is, so we're starting to see, oh yeah, there is a, there is some sort of barrier there. So Stuart took um, 2.5 million molecules um, and put them in an algorithm and let it uh, cr crank out the number of steps. And oftentimes there's you know, a range of different mechanisms, the number of steps that it would take to make that molecule to query this idea, is there a line? And indeed there's a line, it is a squishy line, um, but there's a line somewhere around 15, 16, where above that you probably need an organism either in a lab or um, cranking out metabolites to make that molecule of interest above that number of steps. So um, what I'm showing here in this graph is uh, that space of the 2.5 uh, million compounds uh, binned by um, in 50 Dalton um, uh, chunks. And you can kind of see that line that we're talking about where um, uh, well, that just is the relationship between molecular weight and intrinsic complexity, because that is also um, uh, interacting. So what you can see here, though, is that there's a number of these um, amino acids and PAHs and things like that that we know from organisms um, as well as the stars. Um, so they are bi biotic and abiotic, but everything else is definitely created by life. So then that gets us to this question about, yeah, well, so what about abiotic organic chemistry? Um, can we look out at stars and can we look at extraterrestrial um, uh, organic chemistry and uh, learn a little bit more about that uh, uh, reaction space and if it is um, showing any of those molecules that we think are above that. And so I show here, um, you know, the kind of molecules that we would expect to see. And why I do this is because I do work with astrochemists and I am very cognizant of the huge search space that astrochemistry deals with all the time. There's so many molecules that we see in the stars. Um, but what you will see is that most of them are fairly small and do have fairly low um, uh, assembly numbers, a low number of steps, biological, but is um, uh, but not necessarily biological. This is something made by abiotic systems. Um, there are very, very large molecules out in space. Um, these are some of the things that I studied as, in, as a postdoc when I first went to the astrobiology analytical lab and pHs um, represent that duplication step that I talked about, that even though you can take the same thing and make very, very, very large molecules, that doesn't actually add any intrinsic complexity because it's the same step over and over and over again. So polymerization is obviously not a tool for infinite complexity. And that would be intuitive to us even thinking about 
um, the kind of uh, familiar polymers from bio. So, so um, these are actually fairly low complexity, even though they're bright. is an interesting case because there's a, a the the idea of amino acids um, as a, an intrinsic part of biology, but we're only accessing this tiny portion of all the amino acids that we can observe in nature through meteorites, where there's very large amino acids, um, amber of carbons. Um, and then the retention time is telling you something about how large that molecule is and, and indicating something about um, heterocycles and other features that may be expanding its retention time. Um, and the reason why I don't have names on a lot of these is because meteorites have a lot of amino acids that haven't been named yet, unlike people and other critters, which we can pretty much uh, probably all recite those amino acids that we know from critters. So there's all of these um, very complex, uh, sorry, complicated amino acids in meteorites, but they actually represent fairly low pathway assembly numbers since they're from abiotic processes. Um, and this gets us to some other ideas that I would want to talk about with respect to abiotic organic chemistry and how it relates to com uh, complexity is the idea of all of these um, many, many compounds together in meteorites. Um, you can see here that um, we think of, of organisms of ha as having intense organic chemistry, but carbonaceous chondrites also have intense um, it's thousands even um, of, of compounds represented. So you can see here that um, a lot of, we only have the 83 uh, named amino acids um, from soluble organic matter in, in um, carbonaceous contrites as a companion to that chromatogram that I showed in the last slide where um, you can see there's probably many more. Um, and there's all of this complex uh, chemistry um, that could be networked and we see polyols and PAHs and all of these different things. But something about that mixture and the fact that you're seeing all of this together also tells you something about that system and that it, it might not um, be actually related to life at all, even though it has this complicated mixture of things going on. And that has to do with another feature that we see about life. And that is, um, that there is selection mechanisms that dictate um, what gets made. So in a living system, there is a need to constrain the, the possibility space of chemistry down into things that are necessary. And from Earth life, we can easily talk about those things that are definitely necessary. We could talk about proteins, we could talk about uh, ribosomes, we could talk about DNA and all of these things. Um, and we could say, yes, we only use the 20 amino acids. We only use the four bases. We're constraining that things um, for a good reason. Um, when you're running a biological system, you want to be able to, you know, turn the crank and always have those, those metabolites on hand for whatever process they're necessary for, be it replication or reproduction or repair. Um, and you also want to be able to uh, accurately give the plans for that metabolite um, uh, to the next generation. So, so there's this conservatism um, that's uh, embedded in this idea of information that is being stored in molecules um, and that is a feature of life. So we can think about these distributions that indicate a selection mechanism. So that um, huge amount of uh, chemistry that's inside that meteorite is actually telling us that there's been very little selection towards particular molecules that would be of interest. Um, whereas you and I um, and other creatures could be, um, uh, uh, you know, put into a scheme where there's relatively a uh, few very important metabolites of interest that are that we see over and over again. And indeed, that's a lot of the business of organic geochemistry is thinking about those compounds that are of importance. And can we go out in nature and find them as people interested in the distant past, for example, in paleobiology and find those, those molecules? And I'll have more about that in a minute too. Um, the, uh, the, uh, diagram that I'm showing here is an FTICR um, uh, uh, analysis of Murchison meteorite again, and here you can see over 10,000 um, molecules in this in this D panel, um, and this is just showing you the three 
uh, uh, axes of hydrocarbons and, and oxygen bound to carbon. Um, we can see um, these uh, uh, molecular weight relationships with oxygen and carbon here. And then we can see that there's this enormous space that represents even more hetero atoms as part of these molecules. Um, where you have nitrogen and sulfur as part of it. And if you start to think about the kind of molecules that you would have some of that same chemistry as well in an organism, there would be clear winners. There would be things that would be made over and over again as part of that organism's metabolism. So this huge amount of, of chemistry going on indicates something about the network, but doesn't necessarily indicate anything about metabolism. So as a more boring side, to show you something from life, I give you this uh, um, uh, chromatograms showing extracts from uh, plant leaves. And what you can see here is that for these two compound classes, um, which if you had a chromatogram like in the past um, uh, slide, uh, these things would be co-alluding together. But what you're seeing is that there is a pattern um, in that there's only a very constrained um, length of molecule that's being made. So we can see here they're fairly large. They're between 23 and 35 carbons. Whereas in the example of the meteorite, you could have a huge vast amount of things um, with very small um, uh, uh, numbers of carbon. And then, and then this additive series up into large things. So showing that kind of Lego-like um, reaction mechanism of potential Potentially polymerization and whatever that was, bearing in mind it's FTICR, so not everything is identified. So what you can see here is there is a selection in the organism's metabolism for a certain size range of things and also certain um, lengths um, based here in the alkanes on odd number of carbons and in the alcohols here, the, the fatty alcohols, with even numbers. And this, uh, you can trace these um, reactions back to isoprene, or not in this case, but into um, uh, reactions there where there's a selection at a given point for a different length of molecule. And so this is, a, this is a feature of metabolisms that there's a selection mechanism toward a certain distribution of molecules. It's not the infinite number of combinations you would expect to see just from chemistry. I want to point out another way, getting a little bit away from organic chemistry, even though I like it, um, to try and bring everybody in, in case you're not a fan of organic chemistry, to think about other distributions that we can um, see representing this selection mechanism. So a very familiar example from Earth could be the Redfield ratio. That's what we see here. Um, in this scatter plot. And the Redfield ratio, consistent relationship between the ratio of nitrate, phosphate, and you can expand it to carbon and other elements as well, all around the oceans. And this uh, very uh, stable stoichiometry of the oceans is reflecting life. It's reflecting the fact that life is um, taking in these things and is distributed throughout the oceans and in, in a certain amount of equilibrium with the water around them and therefore dictating the geochemistry of their habitat. And so this you could think of as that selection mechanism. And why we would say that is because if we looked at what bulk seawater could be without life and what sort of particles might arise, which is this diagram um, here with where it says seawater log, we can see that there are all these uh, molecules, uh, I'm sorry, elements that are preferentially being um, uh, stored or excreted from a cell um, in a different relationship to the stoichiometry of the water around them. So this gets to this uh, very agnostic sort of um, way that we could even think about what we would call uh, life in this, in this way, and that's that it's a, um, a concentration of scarce elements that's uh, metastable but geochemically distinct. Um, as another um, sort of way of demonstrating that I'm showing here cells. So you could think of a cell as this metastable entity with a geochemical distinction from its surrounding. And you could um, again, go into organic chemistry and look at it in carbon and nitrogen space as um, this one left-handed uh, in the trio is doing. And this is just an, uh, a Sims image. 
or you could look at phosphorus, or you could even look at copper. And so you can start to understand the elements themselves on um, a landscape or in a solution can be an indication of something happening in that water that is taking it out of the equilibrium that it would have unless there was an energetic influence, um, which in this case is life. There are some very familiar examples that we could give for this. It doesn't have to be so esoteric as cells in the sea or the red field ratio. Um, another uh, way that we could think about this is uh, in a paleobiological way is fossils. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful fossil. Not all fossils look this way. A lot of fossils just show up as um, this sort of scum of carbon left over in the strata of a rock. And when you see that scum of carbon and it's not how all of the rock looks, you're not lead, you can pull apart that rock, find this beautiful leaf. And that becomes for you this biosignature based on not being a leaf, but being an accumulation of carbon in an otherwise silicate um, surrounding. Uh, this could apply to living things as well. These stone crops, these little plants are um, an otherwise anomalous ac accumulation of carbon in this uh, landscape and setting as well here amongst these rocks. And to try and think about the techno signature space, um, since I'm trying to represent all of the interests here. Um, perhaps this uh, circular object that is made uh, actually of old dead plants um, uh, might represent in that same space um, a biosignature simply because it is an accumulation of elements out of equilibrium that surrounds. There are other ways of thinking about distribution too that are a little bit finer and less visual, but of course we can think about go, going back to that example of the amino acids that we know and love from meteorites as well as humans, and that there are vast differences between the populations of amino acids, but other features about those amino acids that make them different in those two pools. And what we're seeing here in the handed one is of course this idea of chirality, um, that um, you really only see the one enantiomer in living systems. And not only that, but in abiotic systems, the Murchison-like system that we see here, there's a whole bunch of other structural diversity um, based on those molecules and the way they are uh, con constructed too. They have structural diversity, alpha, beta, gamma, et cetera. Um, there's also vast differences between the amino, uh, I'm sorry, between the stable isotopes um, in these, um, in carbon space, in deuterium space, in nitrogen space, that tell us something about the pool that they formed in that can also be, could be a powerful biosignature. So this is that idea of distributions that are a selection mechanism. Life is selecting for one, um, one particular enantiomer as part of its pool of ever ready metabolites for uh, the business of living. Um, here's another way of showing that uh, stable isotope space that I alluded to um, as part of its selection mechanism. Um, and this I'm going to try and caution everyone to not look at the numbers, not think about, oh, geez, you know, life is always, um, you know, between 20 and 60 per mil in carbon space or something like that. I would encourage you not to think about this because what um, either of these reactions that make these pools of isotopes are doing is performing fractionation, but enzymes perform a whole lot of it. And so things look very different. The, the pool of uh, isotopes that are incorporated in a molecule by an organism is very different than the pool that it was taken from. So this goes back to um, the, the bottom of the food chain, primary production when CO2 is made into organic matter by plants or CO2 is made into organic matter by other non-photosynthetic um, autotrophic mechanisms. Um, there is a, a um, in that. Whereas when you think about all of the possibility space of chemistry happening out in the stars, giving us those huge complicated mixtures of, or, of, um, of compounds, um, all of that chemistry is far less constrained and, and, and frankly has a lot more antiquity. So we don't see that same fractionation expressed. We see a lot more of the heavy 
of isotopes in, in stable isotope space, whatever isotope system you're looking at. And we'll talk more about this in a second too. So the, the final thing that I would say you could think about for an agnostic biosignature system that can relate back to, to life really goes to that idea of energetics. So this idea of thinking about disequilibrium and energy transfer. We were talking about disequilibrium um, in the previous examples is like comparing it with the abiotic. Um, but when you're thinking about um, energy and you're trying to imagine, when you start to say you're going to look for uh, metabolic activity, you're um, very likely to start making choices about what you think that metabolite is. And another way that you can agnostify that search is to simply look for um, evidence of redox reactions. So I love this quote, life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. And that's what we're seeing here in this, this um, diagram where you can tell um, the electrical reactions that happen in the presence of an organism based on um, uh, when compared with a sterile control. Um, and, this is, and this is that electron transfer that's happening. These particular organisms perform extracellular electron transport. So it's easy for us to measure. Um, and there are lots of ways uh, that we use these kind of measurements. Um, there's, I should have included a picture of it. You'll see examples of people putting you know, lamps into sediments that act as a microbial fuel cell. And indeed that's really what is happening in these cases. And you're, you can say, oh my gosh, there's life here. I'm detecting it simply by looking at this electron transport so this is um, inconsistent with abiotic reactions, and that's indicating that there's um, some other mechanism that's creating these uh, redox um, uh, observations that we see. And this is just a diagram of what is happening here at a hydrothermal vent. Um, you can put these same sort of instruments into other subsurface environments like Barb was showing yesterday. And this is certainly experiments that people have done to try and understand um, uh, the presence of life, especially in an oligotrophic system, where you're living there. I wanted to give some more familiar examples of what we could think of as evidence of disequilibrium and energy transfer. And this kind of gets back to this um, fact that I think I learned so much about astrobiology when I was forced to take a sedimentology class when I was in graduate school and I spent a lot of time um, doing flume experiments. And I thought it was really fascinating how much you could learn about how sediments were formed with or without uh, the presence of of life in that system. So these biological processes um, form uh, stabilized sediments that have distinctive structures um, when you compare them with just the kind of uh, sediments that you would see from in, in an erosive or physical system much like Tim Gouch was showing us in all the beautiful images of Mars, um, where so many physics, and you could, you could replicate it in a flume in the lab. And so on the left-hand side, you're seeing one of those many, many um, examples of a beautiful pattern that you can see in a rock that's absolutely abiotic. We could go and make it right now. But then there's this funny one that you see right here above the letters, and that one has a very different, um, sort of pattern and that would be very hard for you to make in the lab um, just from sediments. Um, and this is indicating that there's something there that's helping to increase in a pattern that our extra and extra could be life. And then the case example, that energy with a trail of and left behind um, it's, it's, uh, its body, which was slowly infilled by sediments. Um, and, and now we see it in rock form, but with this very distinctive structural pattern, which tells us uh, that there was, there was energy input there. There's some other examples that I could give. They're a little bit um, harder to imagine. Um, there are two biosignatures in this. There's the, of course, the tip signature of the uh, lens cap, but also, um, the uh, biofilm on the surface of wetted sediment can cause it to stabilize in patterns like this that are very distinctive and are very difficult to, um, to do in, in a, for example, in a flume. And this isn't necessarily a body. This is probably just um, 
you know, a biofilm, it could just be EPS. It's just, it's just a bunch of cells. It's just some, some carbohydrates, but it's caught in that puckering of the sediment as it dries in a very distinctive way. So that becomes a biosignature as well without us thinking about what kind of cell it was or what metabolism is doing or, you know, what sort of um, analogy we could have with life here on earth. Um, for the techno signature crowds, I wanted to also show, show this idea of a disequilibrium or energy transfer um, biosignature in the same sedimentary system as well. And what you um, probably can't see here on the left, and if I didn't have uh, uh, archaeologists in my family, I might not be able to as well, um, but there is a, a close-up of a piece of Anasazi pottery. And what you can see there is that those sediments have been accreted and stabilized in a pattern that is distinctive and would be difficult to do without the influence of biology, in this case, a potter. So I wanted to talk a little bit about decision trees and how you can go about thinking about an agnostic biosignature system, or if you um, are wishing to try and agnostify the system that you are familiar with from your discipline. And so this can be a difficult thing. Um, we could consider that this is navigating where there's no map, maps because we're not using any analogies of systems from Earth. We're just thinking about fundamental observations and what we know about abiotic systems. But honestly, there's it's probably a lot of the lessons are just um, basic science that all of us would know and love. Um, there's a couple of things that become intrinsically uh, important when you're working in an, abi an agnostic biosignature system. And one of these is the idea of noise and contamination and identification of your signal. And this is just a way of saying, um, you don't have standards when you're thinking about an agnostic biosignature um, necessarily because of whatever you're investigating. So this uh, requires you to be very careful with um, how you interpret and even um, uh, produce your, your um, your data. So I give here a kind of familiar uh, example of, of a reimagination of life here on this planet based on these sorts of uh, questions that probably should have been asked a little bit harder than they were. And you guys are probably all aware that there was this rethinking of the antiquity of many of the Stearings and Hope in Australia, and this was Kate French's work, where they went back and redid drill cores from, that were, had been done in the early 80s with a much cleaner system that didn't use any lubricants. And that's what we see here on the left. And you'll notice, boy, there's a whole lot less biosignatures there than there was in that original drill core. And that's probably an indication of the contamination from the drilling fluids. Um, this also is a great um, example of uh, 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 the differences in instrumentation in that 30 year period um, where it did become much easier to interrogate the signal versus noise in these chromatograms as well. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is the fact that you, it becomes very important for you to ask about your biosignature and about whatever your measurement is, could be, is it abiotic? And um, an, ex an example of where this would become very important if we we're thinking about amino acids is there's the red herring of an antiomeric excess. So I was telling you all about, you know, life only makes one and um, abiotic systems, um, uh, are, are making the other enantiomer. Well, in actuality, uh, a lot of abiotic systems are making mixtures, right? They're making, we know that from organic chemistry, you're getting racemic mixtures. Um, but what you can also see is there's actually enantiomeric excesses from different taphonomic processes that these um, amino acids were undergoing um, during their hurtling around space for all that time. Um, and what you're seeing here in this diagram is the influence of aqueous alteration on these amino acids, that there is this um, alteration towards um, what would be an excess away from a racemic um, mixture. And that could become, um, problematic if you were looking at mixed signals in whatever your, your sampling environment is. Um, the other thing that I would talk about is, does this expression make sense here? And there's two ways that I like to think about that. And one is using history, if you're a paleobiologist and trying to um, be agnostic, 
um, and there's reasons to try and be agnostic in paleobiology as well, is the idea that um, you may be finding um, an indication of an organism based on its metabolism from before that organism was ever actually on the surface of the earth. So there's been a lot of back and forth, and this is an interesting you know, couple of stories that we can have great conversations about. What I'm showing here is David Gold's work on um, colostanes in the uh, geologic record. And this is an interesting story because we keep on moving back um, where we think the first animals were um, based on this biomolecule as we find it in the rock record. And this becomes an important uh, way of understanding if you're looking at syngen, you know, if this is a syngeneity issue, is this a contamination issue, or are we really looking at the, an organism um, that we didn't expect in this time period? So that's the part of does it could be stearines um, where we've, we've moved back not, <laughs> we're not necessarily moving back where we think these are made, but actually what makes it through the work of Bobrovsky that was just published. Um, and, but part of what I also wanna say here is that there's a real importance in engaging with theorists. And so there's work here that we're doing to try and understand that exchange between organisms and their environment based on modeling. Finally, I would say always try to interpret, use other data to, for your interpretation. So in this case, we could think about stromatolites and how we can use organic geochemistry to not only just look at the rock itself and ask those questions that we do about sediments, but then use the chemistry as well. And then going back to this idea of taphonomy, um, thinking about how not only do meteorites and things out in space have tons and tons of molecules, but as a living system degrades, it does the same thing. It's going through all those abiotic reaction pathways too. So this chlorophyll is becoming a porphyrin and we're finding it all over in the rock record. I have just a couple of, of spiritual sort of things to think about as you go forth and agnostify your data sets. Um, one is to always remember the distant past would be just as unfamiliar to us as other planets. So um, you can always take those lessons from paleobiology, which you've done a lot of here in this. Remember that Aaron would be just as familiar. Ancient life would be just as familiar with modern eyes. Try to look at the relation, just as we talked about with Eric yes, series. And you need to think about it in deep time. You would never have looked at the Rhiney chert and imagined crocus. So can you look at crocus and imagine what's next for them in 400 million years? And also life is a core system um, with skate, just like the was saying. Agnostic biosignatures then come a way to explore the possibility space for life and it's root first in our knowledge of the abiotic. So even if we don't find life, we're learning more about abiotic systems that can help us build up robust ways of understanding um, biosignatures at more fundamental levels. And I'll just end with um, a classic Andy Warhol um, way of thinking about appropriation and, and relating that to our science of biosignatures. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather. That's a wonderful summary and wonderful ways of the structured thought of how you would approach this problem and, and also not let your own biases and, you know, our view of life get in your way. Um, we're, we're kind of at the end of time, but there is a, a question from Steve Venner again. It's kind of a, a long one, but I don't know if you can read it, but really talking about the nexus between life and fitness um, as that nexus. I know if people can read that. And Heather, do you have any thoughts about that statement? Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. And I think that does kind of get into this idea of selection mechanisms as an expression of fitness that that when you do have that pressure for certain things to be repeated over and over again, there's probably a good reason. It's probably ecologically derived or in, in this case, evolutionarily derived. And we can think of about how it fits into a fitness landscape.